Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I'm back with another amazing talent. He's a marketing and branding expert. He's worked with brands like Coca-Cola and Campbell Soup Company and Nabisco. He's the CEO of Brand Manage Camp and the founder. Even invited me to speak there with some other uh, experts. It was a, just a fantastic event. You can learn more about that at lenhurstein.com. We're going to give you other ways to reach out to him. But I just want to welcome you to the show. He's also a reserve sheriff. How cool is that? So welcome to the show, Len Hurstein. Thanks, David. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. It's great to see you again. I'll tell you what, we're going to get into it. I want to talk about your book that you authored, uh, Be Vigilant. Before we do, just give us a, a, you know, a 60 seconds on who is Len Hurstein. Yeah. So who is Len Hurstney? Man, I'm still trying to figure that out at my age. But, you know, I've gone through several iterations. I started out in consulting and then I moved into consumer packaged goods brand marketing with the companies that you talked about. Um, From there, I'd gone to a lot of conferences and and couldn't find the one I wanted to go to. So I created my own. And that's where I started the Brand Managed Camp Conference back in 2003. We've done we just did our 19th annual this year virtually. Um, in 2015, I was looking for a way to uh, give back to the community. I became a reserve sheriff's deputy. And then this past year, um, I kind of combined all of my experiences into this, this new book, Be Vigilant. There it is, 60 seconds. Yeah, we're excited to hear about Be Vigilant. He's also a double Cornell grad, which uh, we've got some family uh, that is big on Cornell out here. I've got nephews and- Awesome. Um, Go Big uh, Red. Yeah, cousins, uh, yeah, all that uh, Cornell University. So. It's the, uh, you know, we're, we're farm people, so it's kind of the ag Ivy League campus, right? So uh, we're, we're, we're um, kind of mixes it. Well, let's, let's jump in here. Let's start with the, the book, Be Vigilant. I'm going to jump in here, but give us like, wh- why'd, you, why'd you write it? And then I've got some key questions that I think will be relevant to everybody listening. Yeah, absolutely. So like I, like I mentioned, I, I spent, you know, I, I, 30 plus years in business and marketing and, and brand management, um, and then, you know, last seven years I've been doing this, uh, this law enforcement thing. I went into it thinking that it was going to be completely different than anything I'd ever done before. But what I found is that right away there were things that I was applying back to business and life. And one of the key things was this concept that complacency kills. And it's something we spent a lot of time on in law enforcement. Um, and I started thinking, you know what? Complacency kills businesses. It kills brands. It kills organizations. It kills personal relationships. Um, And so I started becoming obsessed about understanding what complacency was and how it manifests itself and what brings it on and what and and started seeing the things that we do every day in law enforcement to help us fight complacency. And then the book is about taking that and applying that back to how we can use that in business and in life. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. Everybody's going to want to get the book, Be Vigilant. But I I want to just ask, you know, these days, there's a lot of people burnt out. They're burnt out in law enforcement. They're burnt out in healthcare. They're burnt out in, you know, after the pandemic, all these kind of things. They're burnt out. They don't want to hear about getting them off their, you know, getting moving more and, you know, whatever. But they are even becoming complacent in the midst of this. What do, what do we say to them there? With empathy, how do, we, how do we motivate vigilance now? Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. What, what I tell people is that Success is not the end goal. Keeping it is, right? It's not, it's not enough to get to the top of the hill. You have to stay there. You got to figure out a way to stay there. And what, and, and the irony is that the more success we enjoy, the more likely we are to become vulnerable to complacency because we become overconfident. We become a little self satisfied and we become comfortable. And those are all the things that build that right environment for complacency to grow. So, you know, the, the message here is not about paranoia. It's not about hypervigilance. You know what I mean? A lot of times people will think, well, the opposite of complacency is paranoia. Um, but it's not because here's the deal. Paranoia is based in fear. Paranoia is the fear of potential dangers, the fear of potential threats. What I preach is vigilance and vigilance is the awareness of potential threats, right? So this is a book about how to remain aware, 
right? How to build the processes in so you don't have to be thinking about it all the time so that you are naturally aware that you make put yourself in the best position to not be caught by surprise and to be ahead of the curve. The worst time to figure out what you're going to do in a crisis is when you're in the crisis. So let's let's look, because one of the things that really hit me was get off the X, the advantages of strategic unpredictability. This sounds kind of crazy. Like, what do you mean the advantages of, of strategic unpredictability? Tell us about this. Yeah, so getting off the X, I mean, where it comes from and what we talk about in law enforcement is this thing called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, which stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And this was something that the military came up with to describe how fighter pilots make decisions. And so you observe, you Say this again. I've learned this, but I need to hear it one more time. Yeah. So it's the OODA loop, like Gouda cheese, but OODA, right? But it's spelled O-O-D-A for observe, Observe. orient, decide, Mm -hmm. and act, right? And here's the thing. Mm -hmm. It is a, it is, it is not just a linear process. It's a looping process, right? And so the, the game is to get to the action as fast as you can by doing all the steps. The way the human mind works and the way organizations work is that if you disrupt one of those elements, you've, you're forced to go back to the beginning, right? If you're observing and orienting and you're in the decision phase and then some of your inputs change, you've got to go back and it slows you down. The way I, you know, are you a football fan? Yeah. Okay. So a football fan. So say someone, uh, say there's a punt return, right? And the punt returner is running straight down the field and you're a defender now and you don't have to be a mathematical genius to figure out where that person's running and how fast and at what angle you need to run to intercept them, right? But if all of a sudden they start juking and turning and twisting and spinning, that's when you see defenders fall on their butts, right? Because what's happening is they've observed, they've oriented, they decided, they acted, and then everything changed, right? And then they had to reobserve, reorient, and it messes up. So how do we do, let's 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 get let's take this to practical. How do I do this? Let's say in the pandemic, let's say in some change. The truth is, you and I both know there's massive change ahead. Blockchain, cryptocurrency, pro- another pandemic, maybe in the next decade. What you know, we got to get better at this. We got to get better at in our world building trust in the midst of change, but also just be just dealing with this. I like this simple process. I've actually read about this, and it just you reminded me about it. But take us. How would I orient? Like, okay, I can see observing. Okay, this is happening. That's happening. But how do I orient, decide, and take action? Well, so there, there's, there's two there's two things, right? One is how do you get through your process faster, right? And that's what you're talking about. The other thing is how do you slow down your competition, right? And so the strategic unpredictability comes into play on that second part, which is by remaining strategically unpredictable so that people can't pinpoint where you're going to be or what you're going to do, you make them slow down their decision process. Now, you can speed up your own decision process through um, scenario planning, right? Through, 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 this is what we do a lot in law enforcement. We think about what if, what if, what if, so that when the thing actually happens, we don't have to actually go through the process of figuring out what we're going to do. We can move much quicker to action because it's already muscle memory. It's already brain memory, right? And so that's what we need to do in the organization is figure out how are we going to react if this happens? Because if, if we're sitting back and we're waiting to observe and then orient the and act, we're going to be slow, right? But if we've already pre-thought, if this happens, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it, we can move there much quicker, right? Mm -hmm. So so there's two pieces to the OODA loop game. Number one is speeding up your own decision process, right? And number two is slowing your competitors or your potential competitors by not being so predictable. Doesn't mean being willy-nilly unpredictable so that your customer or your constituent or whoever it is that you're serving can't ever figure out what you're about or what you're doing. That's not what this is about, but it's about remaining strategically unpredictable to your competition and to your, to your, uh, you know, competitive set. What, what would that look like? Give it, can you give us one example that's of a brand or a company or someone that's done that well? They've been strategically unpredictable because, you know, in trust, we talk a lot about being consistent. I want to know what I'm going to get every time. I want to know it's going to be the same every time in many ways. But, but is there an example so we can get kind of our heads around it? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you a quick example of someone who's, who's remained strategically unpredictable, right? And then someone who, who hasn't. So, if we have time. If not, think about Netflix, 
right? So everybody wants to talk about Netflix in terms of Netflix and Blockbuster, right? That's that's common. That's the common knowledge, right? Blockbuster yeah. dropped the ball. Netflix came in and and redesigned and, and took over this industry of video rental. But what people don't realize is that what Netflix has done ever since is one of the things I talk about in strategic unpredictability is self disruption, right? So the best type of disruption is self disruption. Disrupting yourself before somebody else does it helps you remain unpredictable. And this is what Netflix keeps doing, right? So Netflix took the video rental business and changed it. Then they moved to streaming. Then they moved to uh, their own content and original content. And now they just announced that they're actually getting into gaming and doing games within their platform to keep people more engaged, right? Every time, every step along the way, maybe gaming's not gonna work for them, right? But what it does is it keeps everybody else guessing and it keeps everybody else playing catch up which slows them down and makes sure they're not the ones doing this the disruption. So to me, Netflix would be a great example of that. Good example. And what was the quick, what was the other example of someone who hasn't done it and they fell off? Uh, like everybody in retail. Okay. So, so, you know, <laughs> what? well, and you could go back to your blockbuster. It's like the opposite, right? Kodak or, yeah. uh, you know, anybody, it, but you know, here's, here's a great example. I, I, I like Eddie Bauer clothes. Uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty simple guy, right? So Eddie Bauer is pretty, pretty easy for me. But, you know, several years ago, Eddie Bauer trained me and everybody else in the world not to buy anything from them unless it was at least 50% off, right? I get emails from them literally every day, ranging from 30% to 40%. I don't even look at them until they get to 50%, knowing that there's a 60% coming, right? They are squarely <laughs> on that X and they will, and, and I just, I just don't need to buy from them. Not only do I know that those sales are coming, all their competitors know they're coming too and when they're coming and what rates they're coming. And so they have become very, very stuck on adX, as a lot of people in retail do. Hey everyone, a quick interruption here to share some big news. April 12th through the 14th, you are invited to the Trusted Leaders Summit. What makes a powerful event is bringing together amazing people in a way that actually makes an impact in the world. We're talking about a get together that is packed with immediately useful content. You'll hear from top leaders like John Foley, the former lead solo pilot for the Blue Angels, Harvard professor Alison Shapira, and more incredible global experts. Get your tickets before they're gone at trustedleadersummit.com and join us in becoming even more trusted leaders. We can't wait to see you there. Let's get personal on vigilance because your whole, you know, you have this whole part, one of the chapters is on the uh, autonomy, fighting complacency through the power of empowerment. But uh, maybe you can speak to that, but also just how do we fight complacency at work, but also in our marriage, in our relationships, in our friendships? I've been married to my wife for a quarter century now, uh, four kids to, to show for it and an amazing marriage. But how do we, you know, fight complacency? Yes. Okay. So two separate questions there. I'll take the first one first. So autonomy in the workplace. We're seeing this right now. Everybody's talking about this the great resignation, right? As if it's a COVID thing. The great resignation is not a COVID thing. This thing has been brewing for a while and COVID maybe accelerated it or brought it to a head. But the reality is that for a long time, employers had a lot of power, right? And what did they do with that power? They abused it, right? And so one of the things I talk about in the book is this, this need to be able to articulate the why it's something we talk a lot of in law enforcement about. Why are we doing every single thing we're doing, right? And it relates to understanding uh, what your purpose is, right? What is the goal? What is the overall purpose of this organization, of this team, of this project, of whatever level you want to define it, and making sure that you can articulate the why. When the why is because we can or because we said so, those are not good whys. Those are whys that work in the short term, but come back to haunt you in the long run. And so one of the things that employers need to do is they need to make sure that they have defined this purpose that everybody can get behind and that everybody can understand and articulate uh, what they're doing. But what they also need to do is they need to give their employees autonomy and discretion, right? They need to give people the ability to feel like they have power over their work product. Right. Because when people feel like they're being treated like a machine, like a robot that can only deliver specific things, that is all they are going to deliver. You know, the example I use, uh, you know, is Zappos. Right. And, uh, you know, everybody you know, may have heard the story of, you know, the Zappos customer service agent who took a call uh, and, and, you know, Tony 
uh, Shay was, was there and she didn't know who it was, but they were ordering a pizza, not ordering shoes, not ordering anything that Zappos actually sold. Um, and she took the time to help them find a place that would deliver a pizza at the time of night that they were looking for because she understood that she had the autonomy to do whatever she needed to do to make a potential customer happy. And she had the time to do it, right? And she also understood the purpose of the organization and what that was all about. So when you give people that autonomy, that what that relates to, and studies will show this, and you know this, is relates to engagement, right? And the more engaged people become in their work product, not only do they become better employees, but they also become less complacent. Because when you're engaged, you're paying attention, right? And that's what we want people to do to not become complacent. We don't want them to ignore, you know, when we're talking about leaders up here, we rely on the people on the ground doing the work to let us know, to send the signals up when something's wrong, right? I just, I'm not going to name names, but I just had an issue this this week with our bank, uh, the bank that we use for our business. And without letting us know, without doing anything, because they needed one piece of information, they actually froze our accounts for without even letting us know. And a vendor had to let us know that our account was frozen. And when we, and when we researched it, we found out, well, what had happened is, you know, our banker, without telling us, had left the company. Nobody had taken their spot. No communication happened. And, and all of a sudden, it got to this point where they just froze our account. Now, we went in and we filled out this one piece of paper and everything was fine. But the reality is, are the people that we dealt with at the branch or whatever level, are they going to pass that word up? Are they going to let people know right? What's going on? Do they feel like they have that autonomy and that engagement level to be able to communicate upwards? Because without that, not only do they become complacent, but the organization does. You talk a little bit about, I, I like this, you talk a little bit about good habits in the, in the, in the uh, book. Tell us, I want to get personal here. Tell us what, what are some good habits you have, whether it's for business or for health, life, family? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this, and this, this gets into the, your second question, which was about, you know, re, you know, your personal right. relationships too. But, you know, um, you know, I talk in the book about the purpose of a habit is to remove thought from a situation where thought actually works to your detriment. Right. So the easiest example is every day when I walk in the house, I place my keys on a hook inside the door. Right. I always know where my keys are. It is a habit that I do every time, no matter what. I don't think about whether am I coming in or am I going to stay for a while? Do I need to hang up with my keys? Do I not need to hang? Every single time I hang up my keys, because if I don't, I get it, you know, this is probably not great for my relationship, but my wife doesn't do that. <laughs> and my wife loses her keys, right? And she can't find them. And we're, and we're stuck going around the house looking for them because each time is different, right? So you got to think about what in your life can benefit from not thinking about it. So another example that I use from law enforcement is when I'm in uniform, when I'm working a shift, I do not shake hands with people. I do not offer my hand. There's, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not a, it's not a germaphobe thing. It's because I don't want to give up control of a piece of my body to somebody that I don't under, know what's going on. I could get in a bad situation. Now, you might say, well, everybody's not a threat. True. In fact, the vast majority of people are not threats. But the downside, if I make a mistake and give my hand to someone who is a threat, is so great that it's better for me to have the habit of never doing it all because that way I don't have to think about it. Right. Because what's going to happen is if I have to think about it, I'm going to make a choice based on how's this person dressed? What do they look like? Uh, how angry do they look? Have I met them before? What a situation am I in? There's a lot of variables. Right. And I can make a mistake during any one of those. So this is this is where we get into things like, you know, in business, what I tell you know, in, in marketing, I tell people to, you know, always do creative briefs when you're doing when you're doing uh, products that you want somebody to deliver something for you. And some people are like, well, we don't need to do a creative brief for this one because it's not that big. Right. And then you end up wasting a ton of time on it. So it's one of those things where it's a habit that you can get into that benefits you all the time. And if you don't do it, the downside is pretty big. Right. If, if, if the mistakes okay. happen, think about that in, in your life with your kids or your family. What are the things that you should be doing every day, whether you think about it or not telling them you love them? Right. Um, you know, doing certain things that should just be a habit that shouldn't have to require thought. 
Well, there's a whole lot more and a whole lot more in the book. And I like actually some of the stuff on briefs and debriefing, by the way. But let's jump to one last thought. Just give us a quick overview of your kind of vigilance ATV model. And I could read it, but let's just let you say it. Yeah, so ATV model in, in, in the book is, is accountability plus transparency equals vigilance. And this is something that, that you know, we've learned this lesson or and we continue to learn this lesson in law enforcement, right? But this applies to leadership in a, in a tremendous way because the more that we are hiding things, whether by on purpose or just by nature, right? The less transparent we are and the less we hold ourselves accountable, the less trustworthy we are. Right. And what happens is if we don't think ahead about being specifically accountable and holding ourselves accountable and publicly proclaiming what we're going to do and specifically about how we're going to be transparent and provide a view behind the curtain all the way through, it is very easy when we experience success, when we have power to ignore that stuff. Right. Because we can. Right. How do you define accountability? You know, I go to a lot of organizations, they have accountability as a value. And I'll say, well, how do you hold people accountable here? And like, uh, you know, accountability stuff. They don't know. So we know healthy vulnerability or transparency builds trust. 92% of leaders would be more, would trust their leader more if they're more transparent about their mistakes. We have a little six step process for building accountability, but I'm really curious, how do you kind of define accountability and what's healthy accountability look like? How do you create it? Yeah, so for me, accountability in the context that we're talking about is public accountability at with, with that, with whenever, you know, whatever group you're working within, with it, whether it's a team or an organization or to your broader constituents outside, it is publicly holding yourself accountable. I, I tell, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll the, the example I'll use in personal life is going on a diet, right? If you decide that you're going to go on a diet or, you know, some sort of weight loss routine and you don't tell anybody and you just do it yourself, it's real easy to get off the mark, right? When you publicly tell people, when you publicly tell, uh, you know, your family, it becomes a little bit harder to get off, but it's still pretty easy, right? But when you publicly tell everybody, if you go out there on Facebook and say, here's what I'm going to do, here's my starting picture in three months, I'm going to post my, my ending picture, right? And whatever, whatever I'm going to do. Now you're publicly accountable, right? And when you're publicly accountable, it forces you to be aware. It forces you to be conscious of what you're doing, right? Um, for the right reasons and also for the reasons that, that it's kind of, you, you've put yourself out there. And so for me, accountability, especially within organizations has to be effective, has to be public. You have to be drawing a line in the sand, something that people can judge you against. Well, the book is Be Vigilant by Len Hurstein and, uh, Len, Tell me this, what are you kind of, what are you curious about? What are you thinking? I know you're a learner. I know you're, you're thinking about a lot of things, whether from law enforcement or marketing and branding still, you have your feet in both worlds. What are you, what are you curious about learning about these days? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm always curious about learning about how can we create better relationships between, um, you know, companies and their constituents. In my world, I'm, I spent a lot of time because I, I'm really passionate about law enforcement now is understanding how can we make a better relationship between the community and law enforcement. And that's why I got into it. And that's why I do this for free. I mean, people think I'm nuts. I go out and I patrol and I, and I do all the things, uh, but I do it for free. But I do it because um, I got tired of being someone who was just sitting there having arguments on the sidelines and, and opining away. I wanted to be part of the solution. And so that's something I'm super passionate about right now. And I'm always learning always learning more about how do we bridge those gaps and how do we better serve? Well, I'm going to ask you the final question very soon, but before we get there, you still run and uh, brand manage camp. You're still, and you're this volunteer sheriff deputy. Um, give us the, where they can find out about Len. They can find you on LinkedIn, but your main website is? LenHerstein.com. L-E-N-H-E-R-S-T-E-I-N. Dot com. You can get all the information about the book, um, Be Vigilant Strategies to Stop Complacency, Improve Performance and Safeguard Success, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you have more interest in the conference, you can do, also go to brandmanagecamp.com. Perfect. And you can find all that in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. Len, it has been a treat to have you on. It's great to see you again. It's been Me a too. couple of years now. It's the Trusted Leader Show. Who is a leader you trust and why? 
I mean, the ones that are closest to me right now are are people that I work with every day. But if I if I want to think about someone who I have a lot of trust in, who who has been influential on uh, you know, especially me writing my book and all those things. I don't know. Do you know Mitch Joel at all? I know who he is, but I do not know him well. Yeah. So he, uh, but I know he's talking. Yeah. Well, from Canada. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Montreal. Yeah. Uh, totally Canada. know. Him. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yep. So Mitch, Mitch is one of these guys he's a where good guy, really yeah. good guy. And, you know, is one of these people who, um, when he says he's going to do something, he does it and he does it mm. without wanting anything in return. Right. He is, he is, he's what I would call a selfless leader, but he's, but he, you know, he's in a position where he's not necessarily leading people in terms of people that work for him, but I think he leads by example in an industry, um, that needs it. And so, uh, you know, he's someone that I definitely have a lot of trust in, um, not only as a human being, but as a leader. And, and it's someone who I aspire to be like. Love it. Len, thanks for connecting with our audience and sharing your wisdom. This has been the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted.